Welcome, Tyler. Uh, delighted to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Uh, if we could start talking about AI, the hype versus the reality, what, what do you think the impact of AI could be on the, the global economy over the next decade? Well, first, I think a lot of the hype is true. It just will take longer to turn AI into concrete gains than many of the hypers realize. But we have created a kind of intelligence that can pass a bar exam, a medical exam, an economics exam, and it's getting better at a rapid rate. So the question is how will human institutions adapt to that? But so much of what human beings currently do will be done by AIs being overseen by humans, and the nature of so many jobs will change. There'll be a lot more projects, but the projects will be done with a lot more artificial assistance. How are you using AI in, with marginal revolution and just your general activities? I use AI every single workday without fail. I ask it questions, I interrogate it, I try to learn context from it. Uh, Google works less well for me. And if you get AI into a long, ongoing, embedded dialogue, it's just super intelligent. Too many people, they ask AI a single question and they walk away a little frustrated. You have to know how to talk to it. It's like training your dog and you have to encourage it and you have to know what it wants and it's trying to please you, that can cut against you. You've got to use it in the right way. I think it can take months to learn, but it's not intrinsically hard to learn how to use it. And what the people who start using it basically never stop. Right, so if I was going to use ChatGBT to come up with a list of questions for you that were mildly intelligent, how would I go about working with ChatGPT? If you just ask ChatGPT, what should I ask Tyler Cowen? What it says will be fine, but not that interesting or useful. You want to give it a lot of detail about Tyler Cowen, even though it might already know that. You want to give it a lot of detail about you. You want to give it a mood. You want to start asking it specific questions about what Tyler Cowen thinks. Create a whole deep, thick, rich background context. And then it, it's like you're a dinner party host setting the context for everyone else's discussion. And you've got to get that right. Once you get it right, the discussion will be wonderful. But if you're the dinner party host and people show up and you just say to your first guest, like, hey, say something interesting. It's actually very hard to say something interesting with that introduction. So it's an art, right? And it's more like training a dog or horse, I sometimes say, or getting a worker to do, do their job when there's some kind of problem. And it's an acquired skill. And the companies leading the AI revolution, are they going to be the big companies like Meta and Alphabet or the newer companies that are emerging? Well, right now there's four major alliances, you could call them. You know, Meta, Alphabet, slash Google. There's OpenAI and there's Anthropic. And they all have their different strengths, but I think they're all going to be around for a long time. There's always some chance one of the larger companies buys Anthropic, but like Anthropic has some of the best talent right now. So the services all have different strengths. There's a lot of good reasons to use more than one of them, not just ChatGPT. And I don't think any of them will be left behind. They're all phenomenal operations. Meta is number one for open source, for instance. OpenAI doesn't even do open source. And how do you see that market evolving? Will there be an infrastructure layer for AI and then a lot of separate data sets and companies with very specialized data? Or can you speak to us about your thoughts on how the market could evolve and the structure of AI? Every major institution will want to train its own personal AI. It doesn't want to send data queries to San Francisco. It wants to keep them, own them, be able to control them. But imagine taking your company, all the data you have, including company emails. Over time, you may record more of your meetings than you do right now, and just feed all that data into the AI. And you can operate the AI basically by voice. It's like Spock with the Starship Enterprise. You ask the ship to tell you the answer to a question and it will do it. You ask for advice. You'll ask the AI, how can we improve operations? It will give you an answer very quickly. You need to check all the answers, but you will have a phenomenal command of information with nothing siloed that you don't want siloed in a way that's very hard to imagine now. It's like you'll have a new operating system. So one reason people underestimate the eventual impact of AI, they see it as a query machine, which of course it is, but it's also a totally new operating system. Just as Windows was much better than DOS, 
current AI and large language models, they're the biggest advance in operating systems we've ever seen. And if we look at longevity and declining birth rates and potential stagnation, what role will AI play in improving productivity and over what time frame? I think it will, AI will improve productivity in almost all areas over a 20 year time frame. In some areas such as programming, it's improved productivity a great amount already. It, that just took months to happen. But more than half the code in Silicon Valley is now written by AIs and humans have to correct it, but it's much easier, quicker and more generative than just having to write so much code from scratch. The real barriers are on the side of the humans. It's a lot of legal issues with AI, how it intersects with privacy law, how it intersects with institutional constraints. Uh, and those will take a long time to resolve. So the productivity gains will come slowly, but it could mean the difference over time between a Western nation having a fiscal crisis because of a low birth rate versus having enough productivity gains that you squeak by and can continue to pay for, you know, everything your society is spending money on. That's what I think the difference will be. And my understanding is that AI queries in a search context, and I'm sure in, in, in broader computation, use a lot of energy. Does that have implications for where we will see AI grow in terms of countries? Will there be advantages certain countries have over others? How do you think the energy consumption could impact the evolution of AI? It's been estimated that a current GPT query costs about 10 times more in energy than a Google search. And right now, GPT queries, there's a lot of them, but it's just in its very early stages. So if you imagine that going up, say, a hundredfold or more, the energy demands will be extreme. It's a bit like if we had crypto for everything everywhere. So we will need to adapt. We may need nuclear fusion. Uh, solar power will become all the more important wind power. Anything we can do with infrastructure, energy supply, those will be truly binding constraints. And we will have to build much more than most people are expecting. I think the key differences will be regulatory. Which areas, regions, countries will welcome this? and which will hold it at bay. And we will see, but they're going to be big winners and losers. The places that have a tolerance for building more things in economic terms are going to do remarkably well. Switching topics to talent, you co-authored a great book uh, and without giving a full book summary to everyone, so they still look to buy it. Can you tell us what you identified as some of the traits that you look for in talent and some of the questions that, that you would ask in, in an interview context. Well, let me first just say the title of the book is just Talent, and it's co-authored with Daniel Gross, who is a venture capitalist and talent practitioner. Daniel and I realized there's no single go-to book on talent. We don't think anyone has all the answers on talent. It's about how to ask better questions and how to understand which context applies. It's not about hard and fast rules. But in general, we think that IQ is somewhat overrated especially by smart people. Determination is often underrated. People who practice well and get on learning curves, where their knowledge and mastery grows exponentially, they're really the people you are looking for. For many kinds of jobs, not all, but often weirdos are underrated, and you need to be good at looking for weirdos. Uh, we talk about questions like, what are good interview questions? Or what are the mistakes that men make when they interview or try to assess women? So we just try to give the reader a sort of bird's eye view what are the main questions and how can you adapt what you need to be doing for the context you face? How long should an interview be? How long do you think it takes before you can identify whether someone's a good fit for an organization or a role? There's a lot of evidence that interviewers make up their mind in the first seven minutes, more than half the time in the first two minutes. It doesn't mean the interview should only be seven minutes long because interviews do many things. They build trust, they're part of recruiting, you just want more information about someone, even if you're sure you're, you want to make them an offer. So for many instances, shorter interviews are fine, but for major executive jobs, senior positions, you want multiple rounds of interviewing and a lot of time calling references and having people in more than once, that's still valuable. But for just a core, simple decision, yes, no kind of interview, ideally after seven minutes, you know your own mind. Doesn't mean you're always right, to be clear but doing three hours rather than half an hour won't change your decision. You're a fan of Ontario, you mentioned. Can you explain why? I run a fellowship program. I've now 
sampled, looked at more than 5,000 applications. We have over 400 winners. So I feel I have a very good sense which parts of the world it's easy to find talent as opposed to harder to find talent. And the number one spot in my personal experience by far is Ontario. It's not even the city of Toronto. It's the surrounding suburbs. It's typically children of immigrants whose parents are aspirational. Now they're fully fluent in English. They're on the internet all day long. They don't take prosperity for granted. They have fantastic work ethics. They love science, energy, building, biomedical health, human advance, totally committed, dedicated. And at age, you know, 50, ages 15 to 19, they know phenomenal amounts. It's blown me away. You see it all over, but it's most intense, in my experience, in suburban Ontario. Incredible. And you also talk about self-learning and the resources we now have and the role that universities can play, potentially diminishing over time. Can you speak to that topic? I see the most talented people as learning more and more from each other in chat groups. Maybe it's WhatsApp or texting, whatever it is. Discord, they're learning directly from each other, take away the intermediaries. And of course that's free and it's time efficient and it's asynchronous. YouTube is the number one learning vehicle in the entire universe and will be so for a long while to come. Very often older people underrate the importance of YouTube. In a lot of areas, schooling is still important, but overall, especially for tech, for AI, people are a bit like, eh, you know, I, I'm learning the most on my own. You run a very successful blog and you've posted every day for 20 years. Can you talk about how you ingest information and how it's changed over that period? One revolution came about 2009 when I got on what was then called Twitter. But what's really mattered is being in chat groups over time with very smart people. And now I'm in more chat groups than I can count. They're not all good to be clear, but sometimes you just be in a chat group, you know, not to say no. And uh, that's what I learned the most from, is from other people. And uh, I, I recommend that, but it's not a thing you can do by formula. You can use YouTube more or less by formula. Well, there's a search engine or you ask people who are doing it for recommendations. Chat groups, it's about who are your peers, who are your mentors. And if you work hard on your peers and mentors, actually you'll end up in very good chat groups. And as a techno-optimist, can you speak about an optimist view of the world over the next 10 to 20 years? We've seen incredible biomedical advances already, mRNA vaccines. The notion that they were in a sense after some point designed in a day is mind blowing. We, it's only a few years later, we now take that for granted. Like, oh, of course, whatever. Uh, similar technologies probably will work against HIV AIDS. We now have two anti-malaria vaccines. They seem to work maybe 85% or better. Uh, dengue probably will be in some major way addressed in the next 10 years. We're seeing serious progress against cancer, finally. I just think so many things biomedical will work. AI already is here, we've discussed that. It's already smarter than humans in, in many areas. And three years from now, we'll be much smarter yet. Uh, green energy is a much more complicated story and it's more about the intersection of technologies with human institutions and permissions and regulations. But I think fusion now certainly might pay off. I'm optimistic. We're seeing a resurgence of interest in traditional nuclear, small-scale nuclear reactors. Solar, the costs have been falling at a phenomenal rate. Wind, a more complicated story, but I think basically it will work where people are willing to actually have it. Even geothermal in strange ways uh, may become much more important than we would have thought 10 years ago. Uh, so there's a very bright future for green energy, complicated how we get it to actually be a thing. That's part of Macquarie's job, right? Uh, but I would bet mostly on the optimistic side of that ledger. Thank you, Tyler. Really appreciate your time and all your insights on what's happening in the world. Good chatting with you. My pleasure.